Thank you everyone for joining us today for our webinar on the crucial documents every parent needs to know about for their 18 plus child or their young adult. Um, with me today, I have Dominique Braggs and George Riley. George and Dominique, do you wanna go ahead and introduce yourselves? Um, absolutely. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Dominique Braggs. I am, um, I am a native Virginian. I grew up in the Arlington area. I am a divorced mother with three kids. And in fact, my, my youngest son is taking his final exam uh, of his junior year in college. So very excited about that. And uh, that tells you, uh, I have 18 years of experience in estate and trust work, but um, all three of my children have been through college and are now young adults. And so this is, uh, this is a topic that has been very near and dear to my heart for the last few years. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, George Riley here. I was a, uh, a career naval officer and attorney f uh, well, for a lot longer than I thought I was going to be. Uh, father of two and uh, learned some valuable lessons, both uh, legally and otherwise, uh, being in, in that uh, parenthood role. And we're going to be talking about some of those uh, as we go through the, the presentation today. Perfect. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. Now, George, I know you wanted to go ahead and start with a personal story of how you came about to understanding all the important documents. Um, so the floor is yours. Okay. Well, as I, I hinted at, uh, you know, I, I was a, uh, a career naval officer, so I had a lot of time in the service where, you know, I was a service member and my family members were called dependents. And I guess that's kind of the mindset I had. But, you know, I think we all, all parents have feel that way to some degree because their children are dependent on them for things like, I don't know, food, clothing, shelter, uh, cell phone plans, car insurance, uh, uh, health insurance, and so forth. So that is, you know, kind of the mindset we go into. And that changes, though, or at least some of those things change when our child, now a young adult, turns 18. Some of the things that we assume that we still have the rights and responsibilities for as parents change, and certainly our children think that they are adults now, so uh, the rules have changed for them as well. But my story was, again, I was a, a lawyer for a lot of years, and uh, my son, uh, my, my younger son, uh, younger child, my son was off in college and we were there at the parent uh, uh, student orientation. And one, one of the associate deans from the university was giving us the uh, presentation talking about their student rights. And among the student rights were the right to you know, privacy for their things like, well, their grades, for example, their the finances, their dining plan, their health care issues, all of these things that you know, again, we as parents were saying, wait a second, we're paying for these things. Uh, why? What, what do you mean student rights? Uh, and the university, uh, in, in their infinite uh, wisdom, uh, nicely put in some paperwork in these folders that we were given for that presentation. And the, uh, the dean ad advised us that if the student consented, they could sign the paperwork that was in the folder and allow us access to things like their grades, their financial records, the health care, all these waivers were in there. And I think to a person, every parent I saw turned immediately to their student, pulled out pens, and they were, uh, you know, the young adult was, uh, with consent, signing those those documents to allow the parents access. But it was a kind of a, you know, a mindset change for me. I said, oh, yeah, right. You know, he's, he's 18 now, and we've got to do these things. So we're going to get into some some scenarios and and some legal issues for that, but just be thinking along those lines. If your universe, if your child's off to college and the university has not provided you with those forms, and or your child has not told you about those forms, uh, something to be thinking about that you'll you'll need them. So you know, yes, they may be dependent on you for a lot of things, but in the eyes of the law, they are now young adults with uh, certain rights, responsibilities, and privacy interests. Absolutely. Now, I know you've mentioned these documents. Dominique, what exactly are these documents parents should have in place for their young adult children? Uh, thank you for asking that question. So it's primarily two documents that we're going to focus on today. And these are the documents that anyone over the age of 18. So uh, the parents that are out in the audience today, as well as your young adult, um, everyone should have a durable power of attorney for finances. That's the document where um, a person actually nominates an agent that can um, make decisions if they're unable to or can assist them with things like their bank accounts, 
with taxes, contacting the IRS, dealing with any financial matters. Um, and when we call it a durable power of attorney, it means that it survives any sort of incapacity. So that's um, that's the durability. And then the other document that you want to have is normally called an advanced medical directive, or you might actually also hear the term of a healthcare power of attorney. And this is the same sort of document, but it allows you to appoint an agent who can make decisions about your health care in case you're not able to. And that becomes very important. I know during the pandemic, um, people were entering the hospital. They were not able to communicate with their doctors or anything. And if they didn't have these documents in place, then it delayed their treatment, delayed their care. And so we want to make sure with your young adults, they have the documents. So if they've gone off to college or they're joined the workforce and they're halfway across the country, if something happens to them, you'll be notified and you'll be able to assist them. And if someone doesn't have these documents, what are some of the legal risks someone may a child someone's child may face without these? Well, the, the risks are that they may not be able to get the assistance that they may need from the parents, you know, who, who again are in many cases the bill payers, uh, if they're on the health insurance plan and so forth. And from the parents' perspective, we may not be able to, to get the information we need to provide the, the you know, the support and the, the decision making that our child may or our young adult child may need from us without some further, uh, you know, complications. I mean, one other part of this was again, my going back to my son's story. We got the university documents taken care of, so that was great from the you know the college perspective. But there was an issue with health insurance. I, he was on my health insurance plan. I had an issue with the insurer. I was trying to resolve that issue. And once they learned that it was not my care that was at, at issue, but my son's, they immediately said, oh, no, we can't talk to you about that. But I was like, well, I'm paying the bills. I mean, this is, you know, he's my son. He's only he's only 19. And it didn't matter. He was over 18. Uh, he was the insured. And, and he was also the, the person whose care was uh, at issue. And the one good thing about it was, even though I was indignant about that, I did not throw down the, well, I'm a lawyer card, uh, because uh, that would have been embarrassing because I should have known better. And at that point, I, I immediately did learn my lesson there. And I did fax in the power of attorney that my son had so nicely uh, uh, signed in advance and allowing me to be, uh, or both my, my wife and I to be agents for him and got the issue resolved. Well, well actually I lost, lost on the issue too. So it wasn't, uh, it was a, a bad news all around, but the risks are that the people that will need to provide assistance to our young adult children will not be able to, or at least not readily able to without having these documents in place. Absolutely. Now, jumping into some examples for people to actually truly understand how important these documents are, can you give an example of a medical emergency and the lack of health insurance information where these documents would play come into play? Well, I just mentioned the health insurance one. That's an issue because typically, you know, the our young adult child may not even know what their insurance is or have an insurance card or something like that. So they may, so someone may be calling the parents and, you know, we can provide some information, but then we can't get the other information, even though we're, again, we're paying the bills, but the real primary concern with healthcare issues is what is some emergency happens. The parents are notified and yet we can't make healthcare decisions again, easily without having that in, in advance of that need, having those documents. And that is adding, you know, stress, additional stress and misery at an already stressful time when we're being told that our, our child had an accident, incident, is ill in some fashion. Um, it is not a, a pleasant experience for anyone, uh, even with legal documents, and it certainly is awful without. So as I like to say, you know, kind of in my catchy way is, you know, have the plan in place for the just in case. And that's what this, you know, that document, you hope it's never needed, but if you, if you need it, you want it to be in place, effective and allow you as your, as the parent to, to be in that parent role and the decision maker as needed for your child. So I, I just want to say, in addition, when we're talking about medical emergencies, this actually happened with my son, the, the now junior in college. But uh, last year he played football and, um, you know, a lot of our a lot of our children and I call them children because they will always be our children, no matter how old they are. 
Um, I, I tell my 28 year old, I still remember bringing her home from the hospital and she rolls her eyes and says, stop telling people that. Um, but my my son last year, he was 19 years old playing in a football game um, and or actually at practice uh, during the football season and broke his elbow. And, uh, you know, he was taken to the hospital. Thankfully, he was able to contact us and say, oh, by the way, don't worry, I'm fine, but I'm in the hospital and this is what's happening. So um, the importance of having these documents in place is sometimes your child would be able to call you and say, don't worry, mom and dad, you know, I'm OK, but I'm just in the hospital right now. I broke a bone or something where it's more concerning is if they say get a concussion and maybe they're unconscious and they're taken to the hospital, they're not able to call anyone. And so without having these documents in place, you might not know that um, that your child is in the hospital right now. You might not know that they need to have surgery. And in order to get that surgery, you know, someone is going to have to give the authorization for that. And uh, one thing I will point out with the medical emergencies in some instances, you may be contacted in an emergency because you are the next of kin. So even if you don't have these documents, the hospital might contact you because you're the next of kin. But what will happen is if the documents are not in place, if your child is over 18, you won't just be able to consent to a surgery on their behalf. Instead, you might have to go through a court process and you might have to become a temporary guardian for your child in order to consent to a surgery. Wow, so these documents really are extremely important in worst yes. case scenarios. It's important yes. to have, I feel like. I know I didn't have anything, so thankfully nothing happened to me while I was away at college, but God forbid something happen, I'd feel protected if I did have these. Um, switching gears to college life. I know we talked about medical emergencies in college, but what about the financial aspect of like academic records or financial aid complications? How can these documents help? Well, just in general, financial issues um, uh, can be a little complicated too. I mean, even if you have access to a child's account, I mean, through our credit union, I was a, an authorized user, but I was not a joint owner because it wasn't, it was their money, not mine, but I was able to, well, the important thing was I was able to put money into their accounts so they had access to it at the university. Uh, but on the other hand, that also gave me visibility on what they were spending money on. So that that was kind of the, you know, the, the other side of that coin. But I didn't necessarily have access to all of their finances. I mean, as some, as you know, many times people go to college and there's incentives to, there's uh, the credit cards. They, they want to have students have credit cards because that they'll spend money. And, you know, they may not even have a job, but then they can say, well, you rely on your parents' credit, but the parent is not on the credit card and the parent may not even know the child has a credit card. So what if there's an issue with that credit card? I am not going to be able to talk to anyone because I'm not on it and I'm not an authorized user. So that financial power of attorney can be very, very important. Or someone is traveling and they lose their debit or credit card. If I'm not an authorized user or I'm not otherwise, you know, somewhere associated with that account, I can't help them. Um, and that can be really pr problematic. You know, was, my daughter did a semester abroad. If something happened over there, um, it would have been very, very difficult to do things remotely without that, that legal authority. So uh, it, even having access to the, the account, you know, kind of the shortcut there, it's still not a substitute for a full uh, financial power of attorney to be able to help them if and when needed. Um, and also two other scenarios when we're talking about um, the college financial aid complications or that sort of thing. Uh, in, in my own uh, family with my oldest daughter, uh, when she went off to college, unlike uh, George's son, they did not have a helpful packet of forms to say, <laughs> fill out these forms so that you then have access. And it wasn't until we received her, you know, tuition bill at the end of the first semester and I said, oh, OK, this is great. And what what are the grades? And they said, oh, we're sorry, ma'am. We can't we can't disclose her grades um, because she's an adult. And I said, but you sent me the tuition bill. <laughs> <laughs> you expect me to pay the tuition bill? And they said, yes. <laughs> but without uh, authorization, we cannot provide uh, things like her grades. So. Um, if you have these documents in place, not only would you be able to make the tuition payments, but you would also be able to uh, 
um, say things like, well, I want to make sure that you are actually going to class and actually studying and not wasting your time and our money. So that's one scenario. Another scenario is if your son or daughter is going to school out of state and or, you know, halfway across the country and you're paying out of state tuition or something, or maybe there was some sort of exception and they qualified for in-state tuition, but you've been paying out of state tuition. If you call up and you're trying to dispute that, they'll say, sorry, you're not authorized to do that. And again, you say, but I've been paying the tuition bills. Yes, but <laughs> this is on their account. And so they have to give authorization for us to be able to um, discuss this or even provide a refund to you if we determine that uh, we've been charging the wrong rate for tuition. So those are definitely a couple scenarios that you don't really think about, but those are times when you want to have these documents in place because otherwise the ed college administrators will be very nice, but they will not provide any information to you. And one additional thing on that is the documents we're talking about that Dominique mentioned earlier, the, the financial power of attorney, the healthcare directive, those are, again, are, are very important and and you know, big picture documents. But some of these things related specifically to the schools, to either even high school for 18 year olds or certainly for colleges or vocational schools, there's another form that we can't provide, but the schools offer to you. And it's called the, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act or FERPA waiver form. And, you know, as you can tell by the name, educational rights and privacy, there's, you know, those the rights and privacy are what their the aim is there. And that is for the student to provide the consent or the waiver to allow uh, authorized individuals, presumably the parents, to have access to those things that are school specific. And it, it just is more an awareness thing. So if you don't have them, um, then you could ask the school for them to have your, you know, be fully covered in addition to the documents we can provide. And that's what my son's college, in addition to uh, some other forms, this form was in the, the packet that we had our children immediately sign. Uh, so just be, be aware that, you know, we can't provide that to you and it's very school specific, but just have it on your, it's, you know, FERPA, F-E-R-P-A, Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. Yes, I definitely remember my mom making me sign that one for sure. There you go. You covered. wanted to know my grades and everything, which I mean, I didn't mind. She was helping. So um, switching on to a different topic, I know we've talked about medical and college related and financial issues, but what about mental health? I know mental health is a huge thing, especially after COVID. Um, what if a child has mental health issues or there's a mental health crisis? How can these documents be very useful? So just to, to talk about this, it, there are two, two items that kind of um, roll together. So for mental health issues, I will say, again, if you are getting medical treatment for mental health issues and you as a parent don't have these documents, you won't be able to find out that your young adult went to the health clinic or received any sort of treatment. And we've seen, unfortunately, I know that there was a a college student a few years ago here in the state of Virginia who had a mental health crisis and ended up, um, it didn't end up very well, basically. And unfortunately, the parents had no idea that their daughter was even going through a crisis until after she had passed away. And so it's so important to have these documents just so you will be notified and made aware if your child is going through some sort of crisis. So that's talking about a mental health crisis right there. But another um, form of documents that I, I don't want to miss this because we have parents who have been working with their children who maybe have some special needs and you've been taking care of them their entire life. You know that they are going to continue needing additional assistance. They might not be able to live independently of you even after they turn 18. They're probably going to need assistance maybe for the rest of their life. So again, even though you have been taking care of them and you might continue to take care of them, and just as an example, you know, we normally think of people who maybe are on the autism spectrum or something like that. So it's it's something they have a diagnosis that's going to require additional care, uh, perhaps long term or lifetime. The thing is, once they turn 18, in the eyes of the law, they are adults. So in most instances, we would have the young adult sign these power of attorney documents.
But in a case where someone has maybe uh, some uh, incapacity issues where they're not able to uh, take in information and process it and make decisions, you as the parent, in order to uh, be able to continue making decisions for your young adult, you might actually need to petition to become their legal guardian. And so <clears throat> we talk to all of our clients who have children that they're dealing with, children with special needs. And we say, as they're coming up on their 18th birthday, this is something that you might want to consider because once they turn 18, even if you're taking them to the doctor's office, if, you know, that you can't just go into the appointment with them because now they're adults and they're entitled to privacy and they're entitled to their rights. But that's just something that uh, we wanted to make sure that we touched on because it is something that's very important. No, absolutely. That is extremely important, especially as a parent. Everyone has different situations going on at home. I think it's important to touch on every aspect of different families. But as a young adult myself, and if my parents did go this route of me having signed these, um, my concern, I guess, as a young adult would be, how long do these documents go into effect? How long would my parents have access or have these rights, as you guys mentioned? Well, from the parents' perspective, forever. Um, but that's, uh, but I've been told that's legally incorrect, so I, I will back off of that one. I um, mean, realistically, until it's no longer needed, you know, if the young adult becomes independent, certainly the, you know, they they don't need the parents to be uh, you know, providing documents related to health insurance or other things. But you know, as long as the individual is, say, they're not married, you know, we're not even living at home, it's never a bad idea to have someone. Uh, like a parent, you know, someone that you trust in that role in just in case. Again, go back to my you know, plan in place for the just in case. When you are then, you know, family of your own, I think that you probably, you know, leave mom and dad out of the, the plan at that point. Um, but for example, right now under some health care plans, at age 26, you know, the, the child could still, the young adult could still be in the health care plan of the parents. And I would say I would want a power of attorney or, or some other waivers to allow me to be. Uh, you know, making those indignant calls for those, uh, what I believe are erroneous insurance payments and things like that. <laughs> so, uh, but they, the other, the practical matter is, you know, the, the, the in place you know, durability means it's durable until uh, re, uh, revoked and the young adult can always revoke, you know, either physically revoke it by tearing it up or legally revoke it by signing it. We're just saying, mom and dad, please don't use them anymore, um, you know, in a polite way. But there's also kind of a I call the shelf life of these documents, and in about five years or so, they 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 don't expire, but they kind of age out in the sense of they should be refreshed. So that's another point. You know, by the time you're out of college, or about you know 22, 23, 24, it might be time. You know, if it's time to refresh them, you say, do I really need them anymore? So just something to uh, to think about there. Absolutely. And then another quick question on. A perspective from a young adult. Um, how would you kind of talk to your young adult of the importance of needing to sign these? I mean, when you hear I need to sign these papers and stuff like that as a young adult, it's not it doesn't sound very enticing to have your parents knowing everything. So how would you approach that as a parent to convince your child or to relay the importance of this? Well, I, I think the importance is saying I'm always going to be your parent. As long as I'm breathing, I'm going to do my best to, to help you out in any way that I can. And so this is one of the ways that even though you're an adult, even though you are on your own, if something happens, I want to be able to assist you. And I will say we're, we're talking about young adults, 18 plus, but I, I've been doing this work for about the last 18 years. And I will say one of the saddest cases that I ever dealt with was for a young adult who went on vacation. She was actually in her 30s, went on vacation and was in a horrible car accident and didn't have any of these documents in place. And her parents jumped in trying to assist her, but had to go through the courts to actually obtain a guardianship over their daughter. But the, the fact is, even though you know, her parents didn't have these documents, had to go through the time and expense of going through the courts. But no matter what, even though their daughter was in her 30s, she was still their daughter and they did everything they could to help her. 
And so um, that would be what I would say to my children, you know, as I put the documents in front of them and said, please sign <laughs> because uh, this is this is a way for um, me to continue helping you if you need it. Well, that was the very polite way of doing it. How about just saying the sign here, see this checkbook? I'm not writing a check for that tuition until you sign here. But uh, no, I, I appreciate that, that, that the more the gentle and, and, and true. I mean, you, at some point you lose that leverage and it's more just the I'm the concerned parent. I'm trying to help you. And just as an example, we had a young man, uh, young, he's probably close to 30, uh, who's a, a police officer. And he his parents, he's single and his parents said, we'd really like you to have this for our peace of mind. And the young you know, the young man said, yeah, I'm, I'm in a risky profession. Uh, hopefully nothing's going to happen to me, but just in case, I, I will be happy to do this for you, mom and dad, because I love you and, and I know you care about me. And that was great. I, I really like that as opposed to being the heavy handed approach like I did. <laughs> so a safety net aspect. Absolutely. To be there no matter what. I love that. That's That's really important to have. Now, opening up the floor to the audience, if you guys have any questions for George and Dominique, now is your chance to ask them. Um, I know we've covered a lot of topics today. If you have any specific questions, feel free to ask in the chat. Um, we will also be sending out information for George and Dominique um, if you would like to set up a console or have other further questions for them. Some and one of the, in the chat. Okay, well, while you're thinking about those questions, one of the things that we like to you know, emphasize here too, and I, I, I say this a lot and people get tired of me saying it, but you know, just like those, those safety uh, um, briefings you get when you go on an airplane and they talk about you know, when the masks drop out of the overhead when bad things happen, if you're traveling with a, you know, an elderly person or a child, put your own mask on first before you help them. And that's the same way I approach, you know, legal assistance, or essential legal readiness documents. It's very important for your young adult to provide you with these documents for their sake and for your own. But it's also very important that you have your own documents in place in case something should happen to you. So we would like you to um, consider, you know, reviewing your plans that you have now, or if you don't have a plan, think about getting one. We'd be certainly happy to have a consultation with you on that. It doesn't have to be a, a very comp complex plan. It can be essential. But it's important for for you and for uh, as 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 much, if not more so, than it is for your young adult. The question we have in the chat is: Should the child sign before or after they are eighteen? They should sign after they're eighteen. Once they become a legal adult, uh, yeah. that's when you should have them sign the documents. Yeah, the only time you can do it under under eighteen for these legal uh, contract documents is if they're either emancipated, independent, when they can would incur, or actually if they're uh, active duty military, if they enlist in the military, they can qualify for signing these things before their eighteenth birthday. But otherwise, eighteen is the magic day. Eighteen is the magic number. Does anybody else have any other questions for George and Dominique at this time? I can't believe we've answered all the questions. Got to be somebody. Oh. Go ahead, George. You Other George. In the chat. Other ah. George, yes. Is there a database? Oh, for yeah. Um, database, no. I mean, I think if you have the um, in the university would have the records there uh, for you know the, your student while they're while they are a student, they have all those records in the student's central file, I suppose. Um, if you file a power of attorney with the bank, the bank would have a, a copy of that on a record, your primary care physician for a health care uh, power of attorney. But there is no central database that I'm aware of to to hold these. I'm not sure I'd want it either, to be honest with you. <laughs> Where would be the best place to store documents like these, though? Should the child hold them? Should the parent hold them? What's the best approach for that? So the the approach that I recommend to clients is um, these are documents that you can make copies of the documents. You can use electronic forms of the document, and they are just as valid as a document that has an original wet ink signature. So therefore, I say, um, first of all, uh, whether it's the parent or the young adult that has the original, either one is fine because the copies are going to be treated just like the originals. Um, I'm so sorry. Someone keeps trying to, to call me during the training. Uh, 
the copies are going to be treated just the same way as the originals. The main thing is to um, make sure that you have copies and put them in a safe place with your other uh, safe documents. For the power of attorney documents, um, sorry, for the power of attorney documents, uh, in order for them to be effective, the agent needs to have a copy of the document so that they can actually provide it to the bank or to anyone else that they're speaking with. Um, for the advanced medical directive, I say give a copy to your doctor, give a copy to if there's a hospital that you routinely go to for tests, make sure that they have a copy in your file. One of the things I say, make sure that you have a copy in the home. Uh, for your uh, advanced medical directive, Place a copy on your refrigerator. Um, if you have an accident or incident in the home, EMTs are actually trained to come in and look and see if there are any medical directives uh, there in the home. So uh, these are documents that I say communicate and share them widely. One of the other things that we offer within the firm, if we prepare these documents, we give the originals back to you and we can make a hard copy for you but we keep electronic copies of these documents. And this is helpful because if you're ever traveling or say your young adult is halfway across the country and can't find their copy of the documents, you can contact us and we would be able to provide an electronic copy. And speaking of electronic copies, you can even have, you know, you got one of these portable devices in your and you're with you, uh, that's often, you know, whether it's a picture or, you know, a PDF or some, ver you know, some doc version of a document is on an electronic device, particularly for medical, now, not necessarily for banking, but for medical, they just want to make sure that they're talking to someone who has been previously authorized to, to speak, the, the privacy waivers are in place. They don't want to unduly delay, you know, the, the conversation or the treatment plan, but they just need something to, you know, provide some some protection for them. So even showing that I am the parent or I'm you know, the power of attorney and it's a copy of here on my phone, that's sufficient. The one place I would not recommend having originals, if you need originals, is in a safe deposit box at a bank because of access limitations. And again, copies of this are perfectly fine, but if there's something that needs an original or if all of the copies are in the safe deposit box and you need it at seven o'clock on a Saturday evening, guess what? Unless you are going to break into the bank, which I don't recommend, uh, you're not gonna have access to it. So, you know, we, as I said, Dominic said, we keep electronic copies. We could provide that for you in an emergency. That's happened to me as well. I've had uh, some clients reached out and, and I was able to take care of that for them. And it was a big weight off their shoulders. And that Monday they went back into the bank and they took their documents out of their safe deposit box. So that's the one place I'd recommend not putting them. So to piggyback off of George's second question. Um, so if they have these copies to clarify, if they're in an, if a child's in another state and they have these copies on their phone, they would still be able to speak with the parents and notify them, correct? Yes, yes. that's correct. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Does I mean, anybody just, else have questions? What they're looking to do is just to make sure that you know there is someone who has been prior has given previous authorization to act, and and that evidence on on, a, on the phone is just perfectly fine. Perfect. Does anybody else have any other questions for George and Dominique at this time? We have another question coming in. We'll give it a couple minutes. As I mentioned earlier, we will be um, sending information out and this webinar was recorded, so we will send the webinar link to you all if you wanted to share it with anybody. Um, what about international travel for these documents? Yeah, that's that's a tough one. The, uh, typically, powers of attorney are not recognized overseas, but really the issue is not the overseas need for it. It's the person back home for the overseas traveler to help them deal with, you know, some this the lost or stolen wallet, for example, dealing things like that back uh, here. Uh, but the power of attorney does not really going to help you in a foreign country, but it's really to help you while you're in a foreign country, if that makes any sense. Although one thing I will say is if you're traveling and say one spouse gets sick and is taken to a hospital, it's helpful to have these documents because, again, they can at least look at this and say, Yes, this is the spouse. This is the person who's authorized to talk to us and make decisions about their their health care. And that actually does happen more often than you would than you would realize. And so 
Um, and maybe it's because it tends to happen on cruise ships or at resorts mm -hmm. or that sort of thing. They, they will accept these power of attorney documents and will then uh, speak with you. Yeah, good, good point. That's they, you know, it's, it gives them something to say, oh yes, you're an authorized person, even if they don't follow the, you know, the, the same power of attorney laws and everything over here. Right. That is very useful. I didn't even think of international. I'm mostly thinking of yeah, great question. when you're in the States and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Um, if anybody has any additional questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. If not, we are going to get wrapped up today. I know George and Dominique had one last thing to mention to you all for joining us today before we officially wrap up. So George or Dominique. So George, I'm going to toss this over to you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you for your participation, uh, folks. Hope you learned something uh, from our uh, our own experiences, and uh, you know whether my own experience of learning how to do this correctly is, even though uh, again as a lawyer I should have known better. Um, and so don't do what I did. You know, be be smarter about it, and uh, you know get the get the documents, follow the Dominique approach, and be the nice parent and say you're doing it, you know, to really help your child, not the heavy handed approach that I might've taken um, because it's very, very important for you. So we want to help you uh, in, and help your young adult get legally ready. So we're offering a, a special uh, offer for the young adult readiness package, the powers of attorney and healthcare directives we talked about. Uh, if you to contact our office and mention to the, the very nice people answering the phone or the email that you attended this webinar, uh, you can get the package for the $250, which is a discount off our typical uh, fee for this. Um, and I will not do the wait, there's more. Oh, yeah, I did it anyway. Wait, there's more. We, we have some other incentives for the parents as well. So a roadmap organizer we can provide you for things. And again, going back to my idea, if, you, if you're the parent and you don't have your own plan uh, in place or if it's uh, outdated, uh, you know, we're happy to talk to you about that. You know, no cost initial uh, no, no cost, no obligation initial meeting uh, to help you get your own uh, plan in place. Well, thank you, George and Dominique. That will wrap up today's webinar. As I mentioned, George and Dominique's information will be sent out to you along with the re webinar recording. And like George and Dominique said, if you are interested in this, please give us a call so that you guys can make sure your children are prepared for the worst case scenarios should they happen. Thank you all for joining us today.